Welcome, everyone. Good to see so many could make it this evening. Um, we have tonight the final uh, Forrester Lecture of the spring. This is the faculty Forrester Lecture. It will be given tonight by Dr. Shoshana Hernandez. Um, but before we introduce her and get her up here for the lecture, uh, since this is the last one of this spring, I want to give a quick advertisement for those that we have next fall. Uh, kind of leave you with a cliffhanger. I hope to pique your interest. The first uh, that is committed for the fall will have to do with, now all of these are intended to be of general interest for a general audience. Everyone would enjoy that, but of special interest maybe to OTA and OTD, if those are um, your majors. The second would be at the interface of math, sorry, <laughs> biology, and economics and business. Um, and that's gonna be quite interesting. For the next spring, we're looking at a very high profile athletics coach, college, university coach. And have you heard much about inflation and recession and all these kinds of things lately? And what is all that stuff? And so how about something you know, to inform us um, as general citizens, again, not, not uh, necessarily, I mean, I'm sure that the economics and business uh, types would enjoy that, but it should be for all of us, right? Just to let you know, um, there is chapel credit available for this. We'll have that. Uh, you can scan this QR code at the end. And there are sign-up sheets, if your professor has said uh, that you could sign up to, to confirm your attendance here. Those will be available outside here at the end. And finally, please don't forget, silence your phone. I'm Luke Fetters, Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the university. The faculty lectureship is selected each year by the Faculty Appointments and Tenure Committee. And it is a distinct honor to be chosen uh, to present the annual faculty lecture. Uh, tonight's 2022 Huntington University faculty lecture will be presented by Dr. Shoshana Hernandez. Dr. Hernandez graduated from Huntington University with a degree in mathematics education. Prior to returning to Huntington University in 2012, she had a variety of teaching experiences, including teaching English at Liaocheng University in China, serving on the English as a Second Language faculty at Xavier University's International Education Office, and teaching math and Chinese at Huntington North High School here in Huntington. Upon her return to Huntington University, she served as assistant director and later as director of the Institute for TESOL Studies. She joined the faculty of the teacher education department in 2019. Dr. Hernandez earned a Master of Arts in TESOL, which is teaching English to speakers of other languages, uh, from Azusa Pacific University in 2008, and the Doctor of Education in TESOL from Anaheim University in 2020. I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Hernandez since she was a student here at Huntington University, and she and I have worked together in a variety of ways over the years. As an undergrad student, she was a student leader in Global Vision, the student missions fellowship for which I was faculty sponsor. We worked together in the Institute for TESOL Studies from 2012 to 2018, promoting all kinds of international initiatives on campus. And together, Shoshana and I have coordinated and led numerous groups of educators to lead camps and teacher training events in China. Dr. Hernandez is an innovative leader, a recognized regional expert in TESOL, an outstanding teacher, a compassionate Christian, and a good friend. We are pleased that her husband Maurizio has joined us this evening. Welcome Maurizio, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Shoshana Hernandez to present the 2022 Huntington University Faculty Lecture. Wanshang 
当你们不明白你们听到的，经常我们听到，但是<咳>不懂。我们看，但是不明白。如果我们想一起交流，我们需要更多。我们应该做什么 ？I can tell I've already lost most of you. That's a shame. Dr. Drury said I might not keep you for the whole hour, but I thought I'd keep you for at least a minute. Maybe my slides will help. Let's try this. Try again. There we go. Wan Chang Hao, 欢迎来到讲座。我是教授是 Shana Hernandez. 今晚我会开始说中文。I'm getting the same looks for you. Let's try this again. Should I just do English? You're not feeling the Chinese tonight. Okay, we'll do that. Good evening. Welcome to the faculty lecture. I'm Dr. Shoshana Hernandez, and I'm pleased to be with you tonight. First, I just want to thank our esteemed faculty for giving me this honor to be with you and for、uh, the university to host such an event every year. I think it's It's a wonderful thing for、uh, for us to gather、um, and be able to share some of the things that,、um, as faculty, we've researched and maybe don't have other opportunities to share about. So tonight, I began speaking in Chinese, mostly because I wanted you to feel a little uncomfortable. I didn't want you to be uncomfortable for too long,、um, which is why I have now transitioned to English, and my Chinese is not what it used to be. Let's be honest.、Um, but I did want you to feel. That feeling of confusion, where you're searching、um, to make sense of what you're hearing when you don't understand,、um, and when you see things, maybe、um, the visual would be helpful, but it's also in another language, and you also don't understand、um, or comprehend what you're seeing. This is pretty. This is pretty typical, right? We're often in situations where we hear things and don't understand, or see things、um, and don't comprehend. And the thing is, if we want to live into in community together, which is why a lot of us are here at this university, we have to figure out how to communicate effectively together. And in order to do that, we have to do more than just listen and see.、Um, so, what is that? What is that that we have to do、um, to be able to understand each other? This is a question I've been asking myself for a long time. In a lot of different situations and capacities, and in fact, I included this picture、um, in my slides because this picture kind of identifies one of those moments where I felt uncomfortable. Now, I was living in China. This is the church that I attended when I was there, and for a lot of reasons, this is where I felt the most comfortable when I was there、um, to be in fellowship with other believers. To be able to read scripture together and sing songs, some of which were familiar, but this was also the place where, in my own Chinese language skills, I felt the least comfortable, because I did study Chinese at the university where I taught, but my classes were all about how to get to the market, all the practical things about how to buy the daily things that I needed to survive, to live. So I learned about conversational English, oh sorry, Chinese.、Um, Things that I would need to tell a taxi driver, things that I would need in my classroom, but I didn't take classes、um, in kind of the Christian Chinese language, and so there were a lot of things that I didn't understand there. When we would read the scripture, I could translate into my English Bible. Most of the songs had familiar tunes, but when the pastor sat in to an hour-long sermon with unfamiliar vocabulary, no visuals, no context, it was very difficult. For me to follow along, even though I cared a lot、um, and wanted to learn, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to make sense of what I was hearing. So this question of understanding and making sense of what we're hearing and seeing has haunted me for a long time, and it's the thing that prompted this research that I'm going to share with you tonight about three years ago. As many of you know, and as Dr. Fetters explained, my role here at the university is preparing. Our future educators, but also working with current educators and equipping them, mostly to work with students who speak English, 
or sorry, speak other languages um, as their first language. And so as I interacted with our students here, but also students um, in schools and the teachers who were teaching them, there were a lot of questions that I began to ask myself. And I began to see the needs that those language learners had, and some of those needs were being met, some of them were not. And so, like any good uh, research study, I began to ask myself why that was and what we could do about it. The study that I conducted was in 2019 and 2020, so I'm just gonna share a little bit about the problem that um, some more of that question that came about in my mind, how I approached it, um, what previous research had to say about it, and how that informed uh, what I did. And some of the implications obviously are specifically for people in the education field. Um, but the other thing that I think um, is beautiful here at Huntington is that we can also reflect on and seek to understand how those things that we learn about in our professional field and our careers applies and connects with our faith. And so I'm going to make some of those um, connections hopefully for you as well. So first, just a little bit of background so you can understand um, why, I'm, why I'm exploring this topic and why it's relevant, just in case you're not familiar with our current landscape. So English language learners in the US, these are students who are in our schools. They make up about 10% of our current school population, K-12, so anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade. And this is an ever-growing population. So we're not seeing this stagnant, we're not seeing decline, we're seeing continual growth. And what's interesting is that every state has language learners, all 50 states. The states that tend to have lower overall numbers, like Indiana, actually have the fastest growing uh, populations or the highest growth rates and that is true of Indiana. Now when you look at language learners and how they spend their day, about 80% of their day is in a mainstream classroom, which means what you just experienced for less than a minute listening to Chinese, that's what they're experiencing for five, six, seven hours a day um, with English, right? And so usually no, no first language support um, sometimes no differentiation, no instructional support, just English, that foreign language that they're hearing. So they do have some ESL services, but 80% of their day is spent in that mainstream classroom. So the result that we're seeing when we look at achievement among English language learners is a growing achievement gap. And actually, when you look at the subpopulations, um, other subpopulations within the USK 12 population, the largest achievement gap is between language learners and their counterparts. And this is a growing achievement gap. And as the learners get older and go to middle school and high school, you would think the longer learners are in school, that gap would close, but it actually doesn't. What research, what research shows us is that as they get older and go to middle school and high school, that achievement gap gets wider and wider, which is one of the reasons that I focused specifically on secondary schools. So when we look specifically in our context in Indiana, a lot of people think, well, this is Indiana. This is rural um, you know, landscape. We have rural towns. We have smaller school districts maybe with a lower population. But the thing is, is that Indiana actually has the second fastest growing English language learner population in the country. And this continues to grow. This is not changing again. Um, this has been the case um, for the last 10 to 15 years. So we're seeing that grow, uh, that growth. But what we're also seeing is that Indiana is only one of 15 states that doesn't require any teacher preparation. So we have this growing population in our schools and we're sending teachers out continually that don't have preparation. Now, here at Huntington University, we're changing that and we're seeing the benefits of that. But in general, the state of Indiana, that's what our current teachers um, are facing. So because of our situation in Indiana, we don't have as many bilingual resources, we don't have as many bilingual instruction, um, instructional assistance or um, programs that are in place, but we have this growing population, and so we don't really know what to do with the learners. And so what happens is they end up in a mainstream classroom without support for most of their day, which basically means that leads us to our problem, right? 
the responsibility for these learners' academic achievement falls on those mainstream classroom teachers. So if I'm teaching high school math and I have language learners in my classroom, it's now my responsibility to make sure that they're comprehending the math. It's also partially my responsibility to make sure that their linguistic needs are being met. And that's a lot to put on teachers. And we're seeing that, right? So there's a lot of things that go into that, the training, preparation, those bilingual resources. Um, but also, if you think about the secondary level of education, we have higher level content. We have higher, um, more difficult academic vocabulary. You're also preparing learners for college and career. And how can you prepare learners for college and career when there are all these other obstacles in their way? Um, we're literally there trying to survive and make it through the day. So at the secondary level, there are a lot of challenges and that results in the achievement gap that we see. So we know the problem and to find out the solution in looking at previous research, uh, we know that there are some solutions. And so that led me to differentiation. And that might be a term that not all of you are familiar with. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to unpack that here in just a minute. But basically what research tells us is that in these situations, what language learners need is content instruction with intentional English support and intentional linguistic support. So that second point up there basically just says you don't acquire a language just by being in the midst of it. Right? And this is a misconception. People think, oh, well, they're going to English classes all day. They're hearing English all day. Their friends speak English. Their, their teachers are only speaking English. At some point, they'll probably pick it up. They'll be fine. They just might need a few more years. And that is not the case. Right? We know that to be true. Research has shown us that over and over again. Um, we wouldn't expect that to be true of, you know, for those of you in the room who have kids, for those of you who don't, maybe nieces and nephews, little brothers and sisters, you wouldn't expect for them to just not go to school and have formal education to learn how to read and write. Of course we expect that. You learn a lot of those things at home, but you have to go to school and have intentional instruction in that. And it's the same, if not even more so, for our second language or a third language or a fourth language. So that presence in the classroom needs to be more than just immersion. We need intentional instruction. So what is differentiation? This is a big question. Some of you in the room probably know this. In fact, let's make this a little more interactive, right? This is more my speed. Yes, Rachel. Who can tell me, I know some of you in the room know this, what is differentiation? Dr. Park, students, she's, she's looking at you. Somebody be brave. Kylie. Been a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Great. See, you worked it out. She tries to tell me she's not a math person either, and then she knows all the answers in, in math methods. So basically, that's differentiation, right? We adjust our teaching methods, we adjust the activity, we provide options, we give additional support, we scaffold um, activities and scaffold processes. When learners are assessed, we figure out what their needs might be to make that more possible, to make the content more comprehensible. That's all differentiation is. It's a big word, but it's really not that scary. So that's what it is. Is it happening? That's a question. To what degree is this happening in our current classrooms? How much are teachers actually differentiating? This is one of the questions that I'm going to seek to answer. And if it is happening, why? For teachers who are differentiating, who are finding ways to make their content accessible, what's motivating them to do that? And for teachers who aren't, what's stopping them? Those are some of the key questions that we need to find answers to if we're going to 
to have any hope of closing this achievement gap and really meeting our learners' needs? These are the questions we need to ask and answer. So, when I first started looking at some previous research, I began just looking at teachers' overall attitudes toward ELLs. And what I found was that, in general, teachers have positive uh, opinions, positive attitudes. They like having language learners in their class. They like teaching them. But what research also shows us is that that positive feeling about their learners doesn't necessarily lead to a different classroom practice. So I might like having you in my class, but it may not translate to actually giving you what you need to learn beneficially in my class. I think that's really interesting. There are actually negative feelings generally about training and professional development. So when teachers are asked generally if you would like to have more training in this area, a lot of times research has shown that that feeling is negative. Um, so that's also something that is, is worth noting. We have to consider what that means. So a few other things that came through in the research when I was just trying to figure out how to tackle this, how to approach this, um, several of the themes that came through were really much more related to kind of that teacher's sense of self. And the first one is related to identity. So secondary content teachers tend to identify as a teacher of content. So if I'm a math teacher, I identify solely with my content area, not so much the other aspects of teaching. I don't really identify with who my learners are or the other things that we might do in class, the other needs my learners have. My identity rests in my content. And, and research has shown us that that is, that is true. A teacher's identity and beliefs about their resulting responsibilities is directly linked to classroom practice. So if I have a sense of identity in things that I'm responsible for, I know my role, I know the things that I'm supposed to do in my job, then that usually leads to something that I'm going to actually do in my class. So that's, a, that's an interesting takeaway. Secondary mainstream teachers also generally tend to place responsibility for differentiation and for their English learner's success on an ESL teacher. So it's very common, again, for teachers to kind of have that identity in their own content and say, if this is a language learner, this is probably somebody else's job to take care of them. Generally, however, secondary teachers feel ill-equipped. So that, that aspect of confidence and self-efficacy is generally low among teachers. One thing that research does show, however, is that um, training or coursework, any kind of professional development in the area, may lead to the higher level of confidence or self-efficacy. So what was evident to me as I began to research teacher attitudes and feelings and beliefs was that there, I kept just seeing these themes come through about identity and responsibility. Whose job is this? Who feels like it's their job? Who's going to take it on? And so I just began to wonder, do any of these things have some connection to a teacher's actual willingness? There's been research to show that there are some of these things that lead to classroom practice. But I really wanted to kind of hone in on that willingness, that motivation, right? Because here's the thing. I can know how to do something and not do it. Right? I can know that something is beneficial and not follow through with it. I can have a great professional development session where teachers are like, yes, this is the best professional development I've ever heard, and I'm going to go do everything. And then they get back to their classroom, and nothing happens. Right? And, and we see that a lot. So we talk about all of these things with teachers. We talk about all of these things with our current undergrads. We talk about all the things that, that they know is good and true and should be happening in their classroom. But is there that willingness when they get into their own classroom? What is it within them that's going to motivate them, to get them to actually put these things into action? And so that's really where I wanted to, um, to, to focus. So there is a gap here just in terms of finding the willingness. So this, this study is going to address that gap. Um, it's also mainly focused on northeastern Indiana, rural, what I call low density schools. So schools that have less than 20% of their population that are English language learners. And so if you think about our region, there are some larger urban 
districts around here, those were not included in this study because I wanted to specifically focus on um, schools like the ones in our community um, and, and the other areas surrounding it. And hopefully it provides some relevant applications as we'll look at here in just a minute. So these were the three questions that I wanted to explore. And really the first one is just about kind of what is actually happening in the classrooms, what differentiation strategies are currently being used, and then second, what of these factors are actually maybe connected to or correlated to a willingness to differentiate. And then thirdly, I looked again at correlation to see if any of them are connected um, to each other. So I know that's kind of small, but I'll give you an overview of who my participants were. So looking at the 15 counties in northeastern Indiana, we had about 80 that participated in the survey. And so I had an initial survey questionnaire that teachers responded to, followed that up with interviews, and then followed up with several classroom observations as well and compared all of those things to try to, um, try to really kind of get at a, a sense for what teachers' beliefs are, but also what's um, happening in the classroom. So the context I've shared a little bit about, the questionnaire um, went out to about 48 districts, 79 responses, and then interviews I met with eight teachers after that. And generally, you know, one of the limitations of research like this is that you're dealing with willing participants, and willing participants generally have a positive outlook on what you're doing and what you're researching. So what I found was that a lot of the people who were interested in following up with me in an interview were willing to differentiate they used a lot of differentiation strategies. And so I had to actively kind of seek out um, one interview participant who did not and self-reportedly um, did not, was not willing to differentiate, which really added a lot um, to, the overall, to the overall research. So the questionnaire was all based in a um, quantitative sense. So all of them were either Likert square scale questions, um, Ranking, rating, yes, no, all things that I could attribute um, a numeric value to and analyze that way. The interviews um, and the observations were much more qualitative. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the results. So we'll just kind of jump right in to the results and I'll try to explain, kind of make sense of, of all of these things as we go. So when I first just looked at kind of my first scan, my first look at all of the data from the questionnaire and just looked at, you know, what was our kind of our minimum, maximum, what was our average for each of these scores. What was really interesting to me was that, as you can see there, our scores for identity, responsibility, self-efficacy were all higher in terms of our averages than our average for willingness to differentiate. So on a scale of one to five, teachers who found that they had some kind of identity as a teacher of language or teacher of language learners was pretty high. Um, the willingness to differentiate, however, that average was lower. So a lot of teachers had that sense of identity, they had some sense of responsibility, and they had some level of self-efficacy. Um, so this was just kind of an initial scan. Overall, self-efficacy numbers were low, which means teachers generally have less confidence in being able to teach language learners. Um, it was the only one of these factors that didn't have anyone who indicated that they were at a level five, that they were extremely confident, right? And it's the only indicator, uh, the only factor that that was true for. So this aspect of confidence, I think, is really important to explore because where teachers feel confident and competent, they will also tend to take responsibility and find identity. And we see this probably in a lot of different areas, but if you think about it, you're probably not going to be willing to jump into something that you don't feel competent doing. Um, and this is especially true for teachers, that that identity, where they kind of place their identity in their self, sense of self, is it tends to be with things that they feel confident in and competent in. And for secondary teachers, that tends to be their content not teaching language learners. So 96% of the questionnaire respondents were confident 
in their content, but only 38 percent felt that they were equally confident in teaching language learners. And that says a lot. That speaks a lot to what they're willing to do, right? So that was something that came through um, in the questionnaire. Now, when I looked at correlations, which was kind of the main focus of the research, what's happening here, and I've kind of circled the important numbers, what's happening here is that the factors that correlated most strongly to that willingness to differentiate were identity and responsibility. Both of them have a really strong positive correlation, which means teachers who have some kind of sense of self that aligns to being a teacher of language learners also likely will be willing to differentiate. And the same is true for responsibility. If that teacher senses some kind of responsibility for the learner's academic progress and English language development, then they will also likely be willing to differentiate. That was not necessarily true for self-efficacy. So even when teachers felt somewhat confident, that didn't necessarily impact um, or didn't necessarily correlate, I should say, to that willingness to differentiate. There was only a medium correlation there. And having prior training, coursework, this was kind of surprising to me. Any kind of prior training or coursework also um, had an even weaker correlation to the willingness to differentiate. So what I found later in my interviews was that there were teachers who had no training, no background, no coursework, but for other reasons, they had some kind of confidence. They had some kind of um, sense of ability that they were willing to do this for their students. So it wasn't always reliant on that Yale training. The other thing that's really interesting is that the correlation between identity and responsibility is even stronger than the correlation to willingness to differentiate, which means that teachers who tend to have this sense of self will also have a sense of responsibility. So those two things um, tend to go together, which again, makes sense, um, but it's good to have that confirmed in what we're seeing. Now these connections were from my interviews, and so what you'll see is the highlighted factors here, identity, responsibility, EL training, and self-efficacy. Again, we see identity and responsibility at the top. Every time one of those things was mentioned in interviews, there was also a willingness to differentiate that was actually mentioned um, in the interviews. Now, the other things that are in that chart that are not highlighted were new factors. They were kind of the emergent themes that came out in the interviews that I had not anticipated exploring. So things like a teacher's awareness of their learner's needs. A lot of teachers said, I would, or my colleagues would, be more willing to differentiate if they had more awareness of what their language learners needed and if they had more understanding of their story. So that came through a lot. So the awareness piece, planning time, if teachers had more time to plan, if they had more of a belief that language learners actually needed differentiation, then that correlated every single time to a willingness. And one of the things that came through in the interviewee that self-reportedly was not willing to differentiate was that he did not have this belief. He said, I don't believe language learners need differentiation, so I'm not gonna do it. That was very clear, and so that, um, again, kind of showed that, that correlation um, or lack thereof. Having a qualified EL teacher or co-teacher, that was another aspect that came through in the interviews that teachers felt like if there was a more qualified person that they could plan with or teach with, that they would feel more equipped um, and more willing to do this. So looking at some of the differentiation strategies, for those of you in the room who might be interested in that, um, the top three strategies that were noted, and this was also confirmed in the interviews, were um, extended time, so providing extended time for students on assignments, providing accommodations that are outlined in their ILPs. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, an ILP, um, is the legal document, kind of like an IEP would be for a learner with special needs. Language learners have ILPs. So teachers are usually willing, um, or most often reported that they would be willing to use those accommodations. And then using pictures and visuals. What is also interesting is that at least in the survey respondents, 100% of them reported using at least one of the strategies that we offered in the survey at least some of the time. 
So there wasn't anybody who said, yeah, I don't do any of these any of the time and I'm never gonna do it, right? So there was at least some reporting of some kind of differentiation um, at some level. The other thing that actually contradicted previous research, which I thought was interesting, um, was the outlook on EL training. So looking at professional development, um, in-service teacher, could be coursework, so encouraging teachers to go back and take coursework in this area, or having people come in and lead professional development. Historically, research has shown that there's a negative perspective on that from teachers. Um, in this group of participants, 67 of them had found previous training helpful, and 75% of them said that they would be willing to participate in that kind of training in the future. So what that training looks like, and what that professional development may look like um, as part of the question um, that could be explored later as well. Now, one of the things that we asked in the questionnaire was, which of these things would make you more willing to differentiate? And these were the things that teachers said. What I thought was interesting was that there was nothing in here related to responsibility. One of the questions that was actually asked was, you know, if this was part of your job description or if this was outlined to you by an administrator, um, and, and that didn't show up. So the factors like identity and responsibility didn't actually show up here. What teachers reported was they would be more likely to, uh, or more willing to differentiate for their learners if they had bilingual resources, if they had more planning time, if they had more EL training, and if there was a presence of or a collaboration with that EL teacher. So those are the things that teachers reported as making them more willing. Now, I think some of these things also speak to kind of the practical element of um, things like time, but they also speak to some of those other elements of, again, what we kind of see is that we want this presence of an EL teacher to come in, we want there to be somebody else to come in, and that really gets to the heart of responsibility. So a lot of teachers, when I dug in on that during the interview process, they were kind of, some of them were willing to say, actually, the reason I want an EL person, the reason I want a teacher to come in and do this with me is because it's not my job, right? So that kind of got, when you break that down, kind of gets to responsibility. The teachers are feeling that way because ultimately they don't feel like it's their responsibility. So then just to kind of leave you with a few quotes that I thought were relevant from, um, from the interviews and kind of speak to some of the, the highlights here. This was from a high school teacher and she said, so speaking about the English language learners, they're gonna miss out on a lot of that support that we give our English speakers because we just don't know. And she went on to talk a lot about the fact that teachers do a lot of things to support their native English speaking students because they know how to support them. I've been there, I know what they need. But for language learners, teachers may not know. I don't even know that there's an issue. I don't even know that there is a need. And so her point was, I think that awareness is really key. And then the last one, which really kind of speaks to that flexibility in our identity for teachers who are willing to rethink or change um, their own sense of self and their own responsibilities. This teacher said, we are, uh, we are not doing our best for them. We have to think differently for them. And we kind of dug into that thinking differently. What does it mean to think differently for these students. Um, and I think that's a larger conversation. But a lot of it that we talked about has to do with this idea of being willing to say that you're willing to do something different, you're willing to see something from another perspective, um, you're willing to recognize that there are needs that some students have that you may not have, that other students that you've never seen before, and having that flexible mindset to say, this isn't how I've always done things, but this is what needs to happen, and to be willing to think differently for those students. So there were clear answers to the research questions, um, and I think I probably talked about all of these enough. There were lots of differentiation strategies that were mentioned, um, lots of them that were reported, and, and observations confirmed those being used. The correlations that were most interesting um, to me, were specifically identity and responsibility, but I think these emergent themes probably could lead to some future research as well. Um, 
And I would like to dig in a little bit more in the issue of, uh, or the, the factor of responsibility. One thing that came through, and I haven't really talked about it much, but one thing that came through was kind of a difference of opinion about what responsibility meant. Some teachers really viewed that as a duty. Like if you tell me that this is my job and if you tell me this is my duty, I will do it out of obligation. But there's another sense in talking with some teachers that they really felt a, a deep commitment. Whether you tell me to do this or not, I realize it's my responsibility. And so in the interview process, I really began to tease that out because there, that really is two different constructs, um, that duty versus a deep care and commitment, where teachers are going to do something whether you tell them to or not. Some teachers will only do that if they feel like it's their duty, and that's different. So those are some things I would want to explore more, and I think, again, like I said, that goes along with that responsibility and putting that responsibility on the ESL teacher or the EL teacher in that situation. So those are all things that could be um, explored quite a bit more. And so I've kind of reiterated that. But the, the biggest takeaway, I think, in terms of where I would like to see this go and, and sharing more of this, and part of this is already happening, um, is beginning to embed some of these things in our pre-service training, but also embedding some of these things in the in-service training when we're working with current teachers and teacher development to help them really begin to rethink what that sense of identity and responsibility looks like because that flexibility in being able to rethink, really that confirms some previous research about classroom practice, that teachers who are willing to rethink that identity and rethink the way that they're doing things leads to more success for their language learners. Um, and I think part of that is related to um, the identity and responsibility piece as well. So just to kind of bring this back, I know there are a lot of you in the room who are in the field of education. There are a lot of you in the room who are not. And as I mentioned at the beginning, part of the, the pleasure for me is to circle this back. And part of the questions that I began to ask myself as I was working through the results of this research were how much of this sense of identity can be applied to other aspects of my life, and particularly my faith. So what I want to do is kind of leave you with a few thoughts. Um, along those lines. And so I think for those of us who claim to be followers of Christ, um, we have to consider some of our implications, some of the implications um, as it relates to our own identity and responsibilities. And as I begin to kind of think about this and, and process it, there really are a lot of connections in the Bible about identity and responsibility and also confidence um, related to self-efficacy. So as the identities and responsibilities of teachers need to shift and change to meet the needs of learners, we have to ask ourselves if we as Christians also need to allow our identities to shift and become more like Christ. Our identities have certainly changed. If you look in the Bible, there's a lot about becoming a new creation, having a new life, having a new identity. Um, there's also a lot about the things that we used to be. Right? The Bible talks about the fact that we are no longer slaves. In fact, we're now heirs of Christ. And if you look in the Bible, how many times God brought people out of slavery into royalty? I don't know if you've ever looked at that. Probably some of our Bible scholars in the room have. Um, it's a lot. That sense of identity um, is huge. And as part of that being an heir, being a descendant, as God told Abraham in Genesis that we have a responsibility, therefore, to obey the covenant. And then in John, in the New Testament, Jesus said there's a new covenant, right? And our responsibility now under the new covenant is to love God and love each other. So we have this sense of identity shifting. We have this also sense of shifting responsibilities based on that identity. Um, and that also leads to confidence. Um, in 2 Corinthians, it says, we are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. And then in Titus it says, because of his grace, he has made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we'll inherit eternal life. So our identity leads to our responsibility as a Christian. But then it also 
gives us confidence, which leads us back to that identity and who we are in Christ. So I think we, think we have to think differently about who we are, but also about who's around us and how we interact with them. So I'm going to encourage you just to kind of focus on a few questions as we end, things that kind of connect these questions of identity and responsibility and self-efficacy to what your life might be like. So related to identity, where does our sense of self come from? And is it tied to Christ? For those of us who follow Christ, does our identity in Christ make us more willing to differentiate our interactions, our routines, and step out of our comfort zones to accommodate? Do we feel responsible for those around us? Is that responsibility out of duty or out of love? And related to our confidence and self-efficacy in doing those things, do we only seek identity in things that we do well, or do we embrace areas of our life that stretch us to feel uncomfortable and maybe inadequate? So just to kind of leave you with those questions, um, I think as you reflect on those things, I'll just end with a few um, kind of summarizing words. So as fellow strangers in this world, which we all are, um, no matter where you are in your journey, we are all longing for a home that is not yet seen. And as we all navigate the world that we see but don't fully comprehend, my goal is that we would strive together, my hope is that we would strive together to understand our identity in Christ, the confidence he affords us, and the responsibility to love as he has loved us. May we be flexible enough in our sense of self to let Christ define us, rename us, and call us to more than we have ability to call ourselves. So I'll just end by thanking again our faculty um, for giving me the opportunity to be here, thanking our education department, faculty, staff, and students um, for supporting me and really for showing me on a daily basis what it's like to live in diverse, um, Christ-like community. Also, I would like to thank all of you who have stepped outside your place of comfort to rethink your identity, maybe learn another language, um, learn about another culture. And to those of you who are here with us, who sit together in our classrooms, worship with us in chapel and in church, and dine with us at meals, I know some of you are always feeling just a little uncomfortable because you've chosen to live and study in a place that is not your home, and maybe even in a language that is not your first. So my goal for you is that we do better to see you and hear you and truly understand. Thank you. Do we have time for some questions? Sure. Shoshana, um, 30 years ago, uh, maybe 40 years ago, gosh, uh, I trained to be a teacher. And English as a second language is what they refer to then. Now it's, uh, it's ELL. We were pushed to do bilingual classrooms, inclusive classrooms. I've seen them move away from that, more, um, trying to be more uniquely uh, interested in how we bring language up for someone rather than just uh, cold water. What do you see with that whole movement of inclusion and bilingual education? And then a second part of that question, what is it gonna take for professional licensure and people that make those decisions in high places to realize how important it is that all teachers be trained with not only differentiation skills, but the ability to language acquisition? Mm -hmm. So the first question about bilingualism is a good one because in general, we did see a move away from bilingualism. And when, when we look at the trends in second language um, learning and teaching, there, there's always kind of a pendulum swing back and forth. And one of those pendulum swings uh, was to a more monolingual approach. And so that is probably the time that you're talking about, but that is swing is moving back in the other direction where a lot of more current research has shown even if the teachers don't have bilingual abilities, 
that allowing the students to utilize their first language, the brain structure is such that there's benefit to that. Um, we used to think that those brain structures were separate our, our language structures were separate, but now we know that, the, that they overlap. So when I'm using my first language and developing that, it's also helping me develop my second. So that move toward bilingualism is, is moving back. And even in the state of Indiana, which is a state that we typically historically don't have a strong pull in that, there's been a lot of grant funding and a lot of more bilingual and dual language programs pop up because there's funding available. Um, so five years ago, you would probably have to drive, uh, there have been some programs in Fort Wayne, but you probably have to drive a good hour or more where now there are programs, um, I can drive 20 minutes um, and get to a dual language program or less. And so there are lots of those popping up because um, native English speakers are seeing the benefit of their children going through those programs and there's a higher demand on the other side as well. The other question about realizing the professional need, I think that's also changing. Um, the state of Indiana is currently increasing their requirements for English language teacher of record. So currently, as it sits, you can be the English language teacher and have no qualifications, have no certification, no background, no coursework. And that is changing. The state of Indiana is now requiring that you have certification or at least have one university course plus all of these other things. So that's a step in the right direction and that's um, something, you know, in our classes we talk about advocacy. That's something that the advocacy of the Indiana TESOL professional organization put into motion and working for the last several years with the Indiana Department of Education. So that is changing as well. I think the rising need, um, the, the population that we see in our schools and the fact that we're realizing slowly teachers just aren't equipped to handle that um, we recognize that we need to have qualified EL teachers, but we also need more training and preparation for our classroom teachers. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Shoshana. Hi, Rachel. Um, in an ideal world, what kind of differentiation do you think would be most beneficial in secondary content-based classrooms? So, like Kylie said, content, process, product. We talk about that whenever we talk about differentiation. So that means I differentiate content when I'm presenting it. So when you're hearing or seeing something, I'm differentiating. If I'm teaching, you know, how to solve equations, I'm presenting that information to you with multiple differentiation strategies so that you can grasp what you're hearing and seeing. So maybe using visuals, uh, maybe allowing, identifying key vocabulary and letting students um, translate that or having a definition available. So when you're hearing and seeing things, it's differentiated. Then there's process. So once you've dispersed information, students are processing it and practicing it and there has to be scaffolding in place at that stage as well. So allowing worker, or learners to work together, um, there's a lot of different ways we can scaffold the process, but making those opportunities available, thinking about grouping, thinking about language resources, um, and then there's the product, which we usually also associate with assessment. So when students have to kind of demonstrate, this is what I've learned, we have to differentiate at that stage too. So maybe it means that some of my students are writing a five-page paper and my language learners are writing a one-page paper. They're still demonstrating content, but I'm adjusting that product for something that's a level appropriate expectation. So I have to differentiate all three when I'm presenting, when my students are processing, and also when there's a product. Um, because if I make the content accessible at the beginning, but don't differentiate the other pieces, then I'm not getting a full picture of what my students can do. So in a nutshell, that, that would be kind of my short answer to that question. But we teach whole classes about it, like Melanie, Dr. Park teaches a whole class about differentiation, and we teach entire classes on that because it's kind of a lifelong process of learning what your students need um, and how to effectively support them in that. Good question. Any others? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, maybe I'll ask the, the audience. Does anybody know other languages that are spoken around here? Spanish is, is a big one, yes. Burmese. Zo, which is a Burmese, yes. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah, so with our new, um, yeah, more um, of a population f relocating from Afghanistan, we have a variety of languages coming um, from that group. Any others? Arabic and Chinese, and, no, and people don't always think about those, but those are huge even in our area, and we have those in our, um, in our school system here in Huntington. But not too far from here, there are several pockets um, of large Arabic-speaking populations um, and Chinese. There's another big one. I'm kind of waiting for maybe Troy. Okay, Troy, Amish. A lot of people don't think about that either, um, but when I go up north, kind of northwest of here, and down south in Jay County, their language learners are predominantly speaking some, some variation. I've heard some different words um, for the languages that they speak, but that tends to be the language learner population. So it is varied. Um, there are literally hundreds of languages spoken, over 200 languages that are spoken by our language learners in Indiana, right? So, um, so it, largely Spanish, but it's, it's wide. And one of the things... I'll just get on a tangent here for a minute, but one of the things that when bilingual resources are available, what language do you think they are in? Spanish. So when there's a translation available, or when there's a bilingual instructional assistant, or when, oh, I can use this translation app and it's really good in Spanish. Spanish is what we see, but that's really only serving a small fraction of our learner population. So about one fourth of our learner population nationwide uh, would be Spanish speakers. Yeah. Let's thank Dr. Hernandez. <laughs> so there's going to be a code that you can scan if you need chapel credit. And there's a place out there to sign if you're getting extra credit for attending here tonight. And uh, if you're faculty, you know, there's a reception for faculty in the library immediately following. Uh, so please come on over. And if you're faculty and you brought your spouse with you, bring them with you. And uh, thank you for coming tonight. We appreciate it.